Okay, the session is being recorded and will be posted later this afternoon on my TCC Blackboard of the recorded presentations link for this class. It's Tuesday, November the 17th, and we're going to, um, I'm going to direct you guys to uh, on your own time after I finish today or after you uh, later read this, uh, view this on your own. Uh, go to the netacad.com website, go to the index tab for the curriculum, and you can unclick all the links and then click on the video checkmark box and zoom down and look at those five videos for chapter nine quality of service. Uh, as a reminder, quality of service is the concept that we can we can put tags on layer two Ethernet frames and layer three uh, network IP network frame uh, packets to tell the uh, routers and switches that this packet, this frame includes information that's like a voice over P uh, telephone call or a streaming audio, or streaming video, and needs to be promoted to the head of the line and processed immediately because it. Uh, Streaming audio, streaming video, Cisco IP telephone calls are very sensitive to latency. They might not mean that much bandwidth, but they really are sensitive to latency. We want to keep that latency down to a, a tenth of a second or less. Uh, I am going to cover today the death by PowerPoint presentation on Module 10 network management. And we'll look at a, a little bit of a preview here of the lab that we're going to do. And this lab, network time protocol, actually does work okay on Packet Tracer. And then um, on Thursday, when we come in for our in-person lab, I'll demonstrate it on the actual real Cisco equipment as well. Uh, we are closed all next week, just like the public schools for the entire week of Thanksgiving. Gosh, when I was a kid, we got off uh, we got off at three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, and we came back the next Monday. But uh, life's rough in the West, I guess. Yeah, I had to walk five miles in the snow to school, and it was uphill both ways. But we won't be meeting. We won't be meeting next week at all. Uh, so our next class after this will be the week after that when we come back. OK, let's see. I guess I should go ahead and start showing the PowerPoint show. So hang loose one second. Share files. Share this. Share this. And this falls under the uh, network management topic. So we'll be looking at Cisco Discovery Protocol, which is my favorite. Uh, uh, a really cool technique that when you hook up a real physical lab uh, to make sure that all the wires are going to the right interface ports and you don't even you know all you need to do is give each device a host name and if it's a router do a no shutdown on the port no IP addresses are necessary because Cisco discovery protocol is a data link layer protocol and it allows you to map out that network connection topology to see what's connected to other things um, Cisco Discovery Protocol is Cisco proprietary. It only works with Cisco devices. So uh, uh, there is a open standard protocol, Link a Layer Discovery Protocol. This is very similar. It's a late dead link layer technology. And it works with uh, all other devices, you know, uh, other routers and switch manufacturers besides Cisco, Microsoft, Linux machines. They can all use this. And this is a little cute trick that the network neighborhood uses when you go into your uh, network uh, connection with Windows and it shows you're connected to the internet, it shows you're connected to your home, uh, home, your home router. <clears throat> a network time protocol we'll look at next. A network time protocol is a method of using a master clock and it's very important that all our devices agree on the correct date and time down to the second so that their log files can be correlated with each other. So if a bad guy comes in and injects ransomware into your system and you can see how he hopped from a client machine and then to a server machine. We can sort of track him through the system. If the clocks were not in sync, it would be hard to do. Simple network management protocol will uh, be the next topic. And that's when you first start a router or a switch and it says, do you want to go into the guided configuration dialog? You're then asked some questions if you accidentally answer yes instead of no. You're asked some questions about simple network management protocol. And we'll see how that works. Now I talked about the log files. The log files should be in sync. Uh, network devices and servers create a system log uh, and they scroll it to the screen, but you can also send it to uh, a server that collects log files from all the devices. And that way you can follow the, the bad guy through the log files as he goes through your system or see what's happening when there's outages in the system. You can look in the system logs and see that. Uh, router and switch file maintenance. We're going to see what commands we can use to back up and restore the iOS configuration file and the iOS operating system file itself. And then we'll look at the iOS image management. So let's get started with CDP.
So Cisco Discovery Protocol, layer two, data link layer protocol, it gives a lot of information about Cisco devices. As a matter of fact, it gives so much information that you don't want to give away the farm and show this to everybody else in the world. But it's very useful from within the company when we're troubleshooting network connections. We want to figure out what wire is plugged into what port between this switch and that router. It's pretty much essential for uh, Cisco voice over IP telephone systems because they use the Cisco discovery protocol to learn what port number they're plugged into on the switch and what extension of the telephone they should be and things of that nature. So uh, this is on by default on all Cisco devices. So um, because it's on by default, if, if you have a serial port or an ethernet port that goes to your internet service provider, you probably don't want to go out that port. We'll see a method of disabling it, either completely on the entire device or selectively on an interface by interface basis. So it gives a lot of information about the type of devices connected to, uh, you can look at it on the router and you can see that you're connected to a Cisco 2960 switch. What's the iOS version? A lot of information that would be, it's good useful information for us that are inside the company working on stuff. And it's absolutely disastrously useful information to outside hackers that might be coming in and trying to figure out what's going on in your network as they're performing reconnaissance to try to figure out how, what's the best way for them to attack you. So Cisco Devices uh, CDP is on by default. You can type the show CDP command and it'll tell you that it's running. I can turn it off on a particular device, on a particular, or rather on a particular interface. So I could go to the global configuration mode for say interface port uh, G00 is going to my internet service provider. I don't want them to be able to see stuff like that. So I can turn, I can enter the command no CDP enable at the config dash IF prompt for that gigabit 00 port. And it's still running on the device, it's still running on all the other ports, all the phones will still work. But it won't be sent out that interface to the untrusted internet network. We have no control over that. We have our own trusted internal network that we control everything. But we have no control or power over the external internet. So if I want to turn it back on again, I would just go to the global configuration mode, interface G00, uh, at the config-if prompt say CDP enable, and that would turn it back on again, on a port by port basis. If I don't want it to run on the entire device, I can just say at the global configuration mode, no CDP run, and that turns it off for the whole box. It's on by default, CDP run is a default. If you use no CDP run, turn it off, and you want to turn it back on again later, you can type CDP run, and you'll turn it back on again. Then you can use the command show CDP interface to see which interfaces are enabled on that particular device. Very handy command, and I like to use it because it gives us a lot of useful information. Well, let me go ahead and pop on over to, can I share this now? Can I share this? Share my whole screen. Share this whole screen. It should blow this one away and share that. There we go. So here we have, um, of topology kind of like what we're going to do in the lab. Uh, all I've done is give the router a host name and did a no shutdown on that ethernet port. All I've done on the switches is simply give them a host name. I haven't done any other configuration. There's no VLAN address. There's no IUP addresses anywhere in this topology. So let's pop into the switch and go to the CLI and let me blow it up a little bigger so it's easy to see. And I'm going to go, let's see, can we do show CDP neighbor from the user exec mode? Yes, we can. Look at that. So we can see here that switch one, this is switch one. Here's the prompts. Yeah, switch one. Uh, switch one is connected back to R1 from the switches fast Ethernet port five, the local interface, to the router's gigabit 001 port. So this port here, port five, is connected to the router's port number G0 slash 0 slash 1. And we can see the host name of the router. And we can see that it's a Cisco router ISR 4300 platform. Capability R, it's a router. The switch is also connected to its neighbor switch S2 through the 01 port. Switch, two, switch 1's 01 port is connected to switch 2's 01 port. This is the traditional wiring scheme we use in Cisco laboratories. So we can see the S2 is in fact a switch, capability switch, and it's a 2960 switch. Now I can type uh, show CDP neighbor detail and get a lot more information. For example, I can see that that switch two 
uh, it's running this particular version of the iOS software. It's running 12.2 of the software. Well, that would be useful information to a hacker uh, if it's an old version of the software, has a vulnerability in it that he can break into. It's useful information to us legitimate authorized guys. So we can check and see what's going on if it needs to be upgraded. So very useful information for that command as well. Okay, um, I like to do this whenever you do a lab, just to make sure that the wires are all plugged together correctly. In the days gone by, uh, pre-virus days, uh, you would get to wire up your own labs. You would get to get your own filthy, grubby, grimies on the wires and plug them in. Uh, now I wire them up for you, and sometimes I make mistakes. So before you start a lab, um, make sure you're plugged in properly. Uh, also make sure that uh, when you're consoled into R1 and R2, you don't mistakenly swap them and use R2 for R1. You have to start all over again. So make sure that everything's copacetic. Very easy. Just go to each device, give it a host name. If it's a router, do a no shutdown on the ports that are connecting, interconnecting. And then go to the devices in the middle, show CDP neighbors, make sure they're operating properly. Okay, let's see. I got to go back to the slide here. Share files. Share this. Does he remember where I was? Here's where we were. Okay. We were recording. We were recording. Okay. So with CDP enabled on the network, I'm going to type show CDP neighbors. I did that in the, in the net lab, uh, rather in the uh, packet tracer. And show CDP neighbors shows us that the devices we're connected to. So in this particular case, this R1 router is connected to an S1 switch. And we can see the details there in the, in the printout. <clears throat> this is just like the lab topology that we're going to use later. Show CDP neighbors detail shows us, well, why, for example, I want to tell that into that device, that neighboring. He's at the R1 prompt, and he needs to tell that into the switch, and he needs to know what the IP address is for the switch. Well, show CDP neighbor detail shows us, in fact, does the mouse work here? I can't see this. Um, well, in orange, the 192.168.1.2, that's the management address for the switch. So if I know the password, I can tell that over to it or secure shell over to it and start managing it. Now, the only problem with CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol, is it's proprietary to Cisco devices only. That's really not a problem for most companies. If they, did, if they specify and install Cisco topologies, they're going to use all Cisco routers and switches. It's... Um, Mixture of device, devices is not good practice because now our technicians have to learn the idiosyncrasies of two different manufacturers' products. If we standardize on Cisco, well, everybody just learned the Cisco iOS. Cisco iOS is the same on all Cisco devices, isn't it? So link layer discovery protocol is vendor neutral, which means that uh, in English, uh, it's vendor neutral, which means that uh, it works on all, it's like open standard stuff. Everybody supports LLDP. So it all works with routers and switches on Cisco routers and switches as well. Uh, wireless LAN access points, uh, Windows workstations, uh, servers, Windows and Linux servers. So it uses the same technique as Cisco Discovery Protocol in the sense that Portuguese is similar to Spanish. It sends advertisements to all its neighbors and the, the, it looks very similar to Cisco Discovery Protocol. But you can see other devices if there are other brands of devices, if that brand device has got the link layer discovery pro protocol code installed in it. Now, LLDP is not enabled by default on our switches. I'll show that in a second. So uh, on a Cisco device, we're going to go to the global configuration mode and type LLDP run in the global configuration mode. And I can say no LLDP. LLDP run, no LLDP run to turn it off if I want to. Again, it can be configured on specific interfaces. So you can use the commands LLDP transmit and LLDP receive to turn that off. And then you can check with, with the show LLDP DP command to see how this is operating. So let's discover some devices using LLDP, kind of like we did with um, our router with our with Cisco Discovery Protocol on our routers and switches. So let's assume that LLDP has been enabled. Instead of typing show CDP neighbors, we're gonna type show LLDP neighbors. And this looks very similar to the print we saw earlier in that S1 is showing us that R1 to the left and S2 to the right are both connected okay. 
Well, let's check and see if that works on, the, on our topology here. So let's see, I'll stop sharing this and I'll go back to share. Oops, I didn't mean to click that, I mean to click that. I want to share the whole screen with the packet tracer running on it. And I'm going to go back to, well, let's see, I'm going to go back to the router first. Go to the CLI. Go to enable mode, go to the go configuration mode and LLDP run. So it's running. Then I'll go to the switch to the configuration mode and LLDP run on that. And then go to switch two, go to CLI, enable mode, configuration mode, LLDP run. And we'll give it a few seconds here. I'll go back to the man in the middle. Now remember before we did show CDP neighbor, we saw the CDP report. I'm at S1, the switch in the middle of the topology. I can see the R1 to the left and S2 to the right. Now let's show if it's been long enough now. Show LLDP neighbors. Oops, I didn't, I didn't, sorry. Show LLDP neighbor. And it's a similar report. I can see R1 to the left of me and R2 to the right of me. The only difference is LLDP has other capabilities besides just routers and switches. You can see at the top of there, it's got uh, my mouse, wiggle mouse, my mouse shown on the screen here. So it has telephones, uh, cable modems, uh, YLAN access points, has uh, several capabilities that Cisco Discovery Protocol doesn't have because Cisco Discovery Protocol only works with uh, Cisco branded devices. Okay, let's see. Can I stop sharing this and go back to sharing the uh, slideshow. Share files. Share the slideshow. <clears throat> show LLDP neighbor detail is similar to show this show Cisco Discovery Protocol neighbor detail. I can see more information about that that's sent out from the advertisement. Again, this could be very dangerous information to a malicious intruder, a threat actor but it's useful information to the authorized people that are actually uh, uh, working on our system. Okay, next topic, network time protocol. Now, this is the concept that um, the clocks on the routers and the switches are have, they have a battery backup clock in them, similar to a desktop PC that uh, uh, your desktop PC memorizes what the date and the time is. And it keeps running even when the system is off. The battery has a little battery coin battery in there that keeps the clock running, little clock IC chip running even when the computer is turned off. So some devices don't have battery backup clocks in them. So they need to be synchronized to the accurate time when the time starts up. They need a time reference. So network time protocol is used, and it's very important with Cisco routers or whatever brand that we're using, routers, switches, network devices, uh, servers, all create log files. And we want those log files to, uh, at the beginning of each log file line, is a date and time stamp that tells what time that event occurred. We want those to be in sync with all the other routers and switches. And if they all have a central time reference they can agree upon, uh, then we can see what something happens at the ex this exact date, month, and day, and, and minute and second. On one device, we can line it up with what happens on another device. So you can manually configure the date and time. In the example of this print here, you can manually type in the clock set command and type the date and time, and the year and the, and the month and the day and so forth, and it'll set it to that particular time. But what if you have several dozens or hundreds of devices? You want to run along with them and manually synchronize their clocks by typing the date and time in them? Well, uh, here's our better solution is to configure a network time protocol on the network and allow one or more routers to uh, uh, act as a time and master clock. And everyone else will look to that master clock on that one device if they need to concept their time, uh, make sure their time is uh, set properly. So we can just use a, 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 our own master clock 
or you can use a, a, a network time protocol server that's on the internet. Uh, this is using port number 123, and wh whatever, wh regardless of whether you use the publicly available NTP server on the internet or your own clock, just make sure that you have this reference point and you pointed all your other devices to it. So let's see, how many NTP servers should you have? Well, if you have two of them uh, and they're off each off by a minute from each other, which one do you believe? So a man with two watches never knows what time it is. A man with one watch always knows what time it is. And typically in a big corporate environment, they'll use three of these so that uh, what it, uh, it'll be uh, uh, that whoever two of them vote for for the closer time, that would be the time that they would use. In our little lab, we're just going to have one. So we're going to say the man with one watch always knows what time it is. So there's a hierarchical structure in that when we go, let me turn on my crayon here. Uh, this this is stratum zero. This is the government run National Bureau of Standards master time clock, a cesium atomic clock synchronized to astronomy and all the stars. And we know exactly what time it is. And you can uh, <clears throat> you can go over the Internet and connect to one of the, these and say, well, what, what time is it right now? A stratum one clock might be the servers that we have at our main office, corporate office. The stratum two office might be the servers we have at um, uh, branch office and stratum three might be the service we have at our remote salesman's office or something. So maximum hop count of 15. If it's a uh, number 16, that means it's not it's not synchronized. So when I do this demonstration, I'm just going to make one Cisco router be stratum one, and then the two switches will get their time. Uh, after about four minute delay or so, the switch so switches will be synchronized with the router clock, and they'll all agree that uh, the router is the authoritative source of what time it is actually. So we're the man with one clock, and that clock is rather R1. He's going to tell us what time it is. So stratum zero, very high precision devices, typically run by the governments. Uh, stratum one, devices that are directly connected, and that will be our primary standard for our particular network. And then stratum two and lower devices would be get their ultimate authority from the higher level devices. This kind of sounds like DNS. We have our master DNS server. And then we have our ISP DNS server, and then we have Tarrant County College's DNS server, and they all look up the hierarchy if they need to be updated. He says before you configure network time protocol on the network, use the show clock command to make sure the soft time is correct. So if we do show clock detail, we can see in this particular print that the time source was configured by the user. He didn't get his master clock from an NTP server. This is going to be R1 is going to be our um, R1 is going to be our master clock for this lab. We're not connected to the internet with this, and we'll say whatever time he asks. That's going to be our accepted uh, uh, time reference that the two uh, switches S1 and S2 will use for. So we can type show clock detail and see that the clock. Uh, in this particular case, R1 is a crayon still on. Yeah, we go. So on this particular case, R1 says said, point to, to another server whose IP address is 209.165.200.225. That's a, kind of a public IP address. That's a, it's actually a pretend public IP address that we use in training and documentation. It's not, you know, class, it's not uh, RFC 1918 10.172.16 or 192.168. So after you point your device to the server and wait a few moments, at, at that time, it'll come back when you show, show clock detail he'll say his time source is from that upper hierarchy level NTP server that you pointed him to. Now in our lab, R1 is going to be the master clock and the two switches will point to them. So we'll see that when I show that print. Show NTP associations will show the IP address of that master clock and show NTP status will show us that the clock has been synchronized. Now, when we do this in the lab and even when you do this on actual real Cisco devices, it takes an incredibly long amount of time for the two switches to synchronize with the router, who is the time reference. So we'll keep typing show NTP status, show NTP status, and for three or four minutes, nothing will seem to happen. Finally, they will synchronize. And if you do this in Packet Tracer, it's going to be the same way. It's going to take quite a long time to synchronize. So uh, let's see, one more show, show figure here. So now uh, the, the S1 has pointed back to 192.168.1.1. In our lab, it's 10.22.1.1, something like that. 
And then after a, a, a certain amount of time, when we show NTP associations, we'll say we're pointing to that reference clock. And when we uh, show NTP status, we'll see it is synchronized. But when I first do it, he's going to say it's not synchronized because it hasn't been quite three or four minutes yet. Let me go ahead and do that now just to show you what's going on. So let me stop this. Share the screen. Share the whole entire screen with Packet Tracer. And what I'm going to do is go to R1. I'm going to make R1 the master. I'm in the global configuration mode. So I'm going to say NTP master. Yes, master, you are the master. OK. Now let's go back to the router, uh, to the switch, and go to the configuration mode and say NTP server. What is that server? Oh, I, I can't do this yet. I haven't put IP addresses in. Hold on, we got to add some IP addresses. Or right, this ain't going to work. OK, uh, let me say. Uh, 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 interface, whatever you do. Show IP interface brief. Show IP interface brief. I think it's G0. Show IP interface brief. I think it's G001 is the one that's connected here. So I'll go to the configuration mode. Config T interface gigabit zero slash zero slash one. And he's supposed to have an IP address of, what did it say in the lab? Uh, um, I think it was 10. Dot twenty two dot zero dot one something like that, and I'll do that shutdown. Oops, oops. IP address in dot twenty two dot zero dot one, and do that shutdown. Now I'll go to S one and let's give S one. The NTP server is not going to work until I give an IP address. So how about interface VLAN one, IP address. 10.22.0.2. With no shutdown on the interface VLAN 1, the uh, management VLAN. And then we'll go to router. Uh, so I switch to and give them some IP connectivity. I didn't need IP connectivity for show CDP neighbor, show LDDP neighbor. Those are all data link layer technologies. But network time protocol requires IP to work. OK, so we'll go to the enable mode and the configuration mode and interface uh, VLAN 1 and IP address 10.22.0.3, something like that. You'll know shut down. And let's see if we can have any kind of connectivity here. Can I ping 10.0.22.1 with the default gateway router? I forget to do no shutdown or something. Oh, the green light's on. What's going on here? Oh, I mistyped. I mistyped the IP address. Ten, ping, ten, dot twenty two dot zero dot one. Wasn't that it? Okay, we're getting connectivity. Now, how about the uh, other switch? Can we ping it? Okay, good. We have IP connectivity. Okay. So let me go back to the configuration mode in S2 and say NTP, oops, not BTP, NTP server. And my server was the 10.22.0.1, wasn't it? Now, show, oops, show NTP status. Ooh, unsynchronized, unsynchronized, bad magic. Uh, it'll be okay in about four minutes. Let's do the same thing on, on this one here. So we're going to go to the configuration mode and NTP, uh, uh, NTP server is 10.22.0.1. Show NTP status. Not yet synchronized. We'll let that hang loose for a minute. And we're going to come back in a few minutes and check it. And they're going to be just peachy keen and just fine. Okay, so stop sharing this. And I need to start sharing again the slides. We'll go a little bit into the slideshow for a couple minutes and then I'll come back and we'll check this. Okay, let's uh, look at simple network management protocol for a little bit. And this is a, a feature that 
You could console into all the devices and type show interfaces, but you want to collect this stuff in an automated fashion and show it on a master management screen. So a simple network management protocol is something that allows us to see equivalent to topping a bunch of show commands on a bunch of different network devices and conglomerating all this stuff in one super management screen that we can see the whole status of the whole network all at once and see if everything's green up and up or if there's any yellow or red since something is going down. So there's three parts here. A simple network management protocol manager is a device that runs on a Cisco router or a switch or a server, any device we want to manage, network address we want to manage. And the simple network management protocol agents are the, the little things we're looking at, like is this interface up and up? Uh, how many error, interface errors and uh, collisions have there been on this particular Ethernet interface? And all this information is put into a small database inside that Cisco router or switch called the Management Information Base, or MIB. And that is used to uh, then the, the, the master management device, which is a sophisticated desktop PC, will query these devices at some interval, maybe every 30 minutes. We can also define the agents that if a certain disastrous event occurs, don't wait for the next 30 minutes to occur, go ahead and send an immediate message to the management, to the SMMP uh, uh, manager so you can see what's going on here. This uses uh, ports UDP port 61 and 62, and it's UDP, which means no positive link announcement and, and retransmission. So let's see, is the pencil still working? I gotta turn the pencil on again. So here's our, our, our this is in a network operation center. This simple network management protocol is running a, typically uh, there are open source programs and there are paid programs like Hewlett Packard OpenView uh, that run on this big screen manager workstation. He can see everything all in one glance instead of having to console into 200 different devices and check them out one by one. So now this is a this is a this danger of simple management protocol. I can get information from a router or a switch. I can also set information, which means I can do the equivalent of being at the config T configuration level of the device and change that device. So that means you have to be very careful with simple network management protocol and understand the security of it. Uh, there's a version three is the latest version. You really should be using this. Okay, I'll tell you a story. About 20 years ago, when I first started teaching Cisco, there was a bug found in the iOS and that the simple network management protocol was on by default and no one knew it and they didn't really Lies it, they had no SMMP training. And the bad guys, without knowledge of the enable secret password, could come in and change the configuration of a device. So Cisco's answer was to, by default, turn off the simple network management protocol uh, running code. So if you want to use it, you have to turn it on again. This is very similar to what Microsoft Server did about the same time. In the early versions of Microsoft Server, Windows 2000, it would install a web browser by default. And people didn't realize that because there was nothing that popped up on the screen when you put in the CD and installed the operating system on the hard drive. They just wanted it to be a file and print server. They didn't want it to be a web server. And the bad guys realized this and they would like store their, you know, their, what do you call it, Pirate Bay files uh, that they were collecting and they'd use your server for free storage. So when Microsoft realized this, they changed the operating system, install routine, install set to when it installs the server now, he doesn't turn on the web server. He doesn't turn on the FTP file server. You have to ask for it to be installed now. That's more secure, that's better practice. Now, get set and traps. So the get command is I can go to the router and say, give me your show interfaces G0. I wanna see how many packets have gone in the past 30 minutes. The set command is the dangerous one in that it, you might want to change the configuration of the device to uh, manage something. Typically, these uh, routers and switches would send this information back on a pulled basis about every 30 minutes or so. But if something happens out of the ordinary, I want that router to send a trap message and tell me immediately what's going on. This is too important to wait for the next 30 minute interval to take place. I want you to tell me right away that an interface port has gone down, maybe the phone line. The T T1 lease phone line went down or something. I need to know about this right now. So please uh, send this to my management workstation so I can get this red alert immediate, immediately and be, I don't want to be proactive about this and fix this. I don't want to have to be reactive about it and that I'm blindsided and the only way I find out is 
hundreds of users start calling the help desk and say they can't lock in. So SMMP agents reside on managed devices, routers and switches. They collect and store information. They store it locally in the management information base on that router or switches device. And then they use the agent to access information and send it, uh, give me, the management workstation says, give me your 30 minute update on how many collisions have occurred on this ethernet port. So get is okay, it's a show command. Show commands don't change anything. Set is, oh, shut down, that's a set command. I brought the interface down. So a set command can cause an action to occur, like take an interface down, even reload the router, even change the configuration on the router. So that was the danger of the early versions of simple network management protocol is this set did not require knowledge of the enable secret password. Oh dear, bad magic. So the simple network management protocol agent is responding to the manager request. The management says, give me your management information database, the equivalent of show everything. Show me all the interfaces. I want to make sure their ports are all good and they're not overwhelmed with data. The set variable is I'm going to go and change the configuration on that router R1. Uh, um, I don't think that's very good practice. I think you should log into the console board or log into the VTY line and log in with the enable secret password and change it that way uh, uh, like we've been doing so far. Now traps, here's an example of a trap. It's not 30 minutes, the 30 minute interval is not yet up yet. And our lady system administrator in the green sweater is looking at her screen and she thinks everything's cool. When an interface port goes down on the router R1, that G000 has gone down. And she won't know about it for another 30 minutes if we don't do something special to tell her. So the SMMP code on the router can be programmed to say, well, if this port goes down right away, don't wait for another query 29 minutes from now. Immediately send out a trap message so that the system administrator's screen uh, will know she'll, she'll get a red message on her screen or she'll get a text message or a page or a golf or something where she knows that uh, something has gone and she needs to fix this. She can't afford to wait 29 minutes for this because the company operations have failed. We can't talk to our home office or the internet. So take a look now, he's saying. Very cool feature in SMNP. Okay, the version numbers, uh, version one, uh, uh, SMNP version one. Uh, there was a big problem in here in that the passwords were published, the passwords were the word password and the word private. And very big security risk here, we should not use this. In simple network management protocol version two, uh, it uses a, a better authentication method, and they've cleaned up the error message process and protocols. But today, we should be using simple network management protocol version 3. We can use username authentication, and we can use uh, hash codes to prove that the data has not been corrupted with by the man in the middle, or I call it the monkey in the middle attack. And we can encrypt the data using uh, triple DES AES encryption, so that bad guys using Wireshark or employees who have no business looking at this can, can see what's going on with their data. Hang loose, just checking in. 10, it's one, two, three, four. Okay, we're cool. Community strings that control access to the management information base, they're plain text passwords. Okay, well, if a, a Telnet and FTP use plain text passwords, if I'm running Wireshark, I can see your password. It hasn't been encrypted. Um, they do authenticate, but they authenticate it using plain text. And after running a wire sniffing program, a packet sniffing program, I can see this. So there's two types of community strings. Read only, that's like the show command. It's read only, it doesn't change anything. Kind of like being at the user exec mode. I can't change nothing. Read write is like being at the privilege exec mode. I can go to config T, I can change objects. So the management information base, base uh, object ID is this hierarchical, hierarch, hier hierarchical uh, uh, structure of how we go down and look at all the particular um, things that are present in that, in that um, uh, particular database. So, oh, it's so convoluted looking. So we have uh, uh, the level from, am I still on? Okay, so here's the world, the organization, the Department of Defense, the internet, our private company, this enterprise of the company, the Cisco device in this branch office, 
and uh, it gives a sort of a dotted decimal type looking number that's the object ID. So a simple network management protocol will pull these devices. So the, manage, the network management workstation will pull the device every 30 minutes typically and say, give me the equivalent of a show uh, interfaces, show uh, users. I want to see what's going on with this particular device. And this goes back to the network management workstation. And um, uh, he can see all that current status of all these particular databases. OK, let's go to syslog now. Syslog is a function that allows, well, have you noticed when you do any type of lab that you say type a no shutdown command? And after a five or 10 second brief delay, and just long enough for you to start typing something else, this jingle jangle strikes and chops your typing in half, and it puts a message up on the screen that says that Ethernet interface G00 is up and up. And it chops what you were typing in half. And then you got to type it all over again. And, but once it scrolls off the top of the screen, it's gone forever. So syslog is a feature to send these system messages not only to the screen where they could be lost. You can scroll back and see them maybe a little bit. Oh, yeah, that early version of HyperTerminal had a scroll back bug. And when you scroll back, it was corrupted garbage. And Microsoft never fixed that. Now, you can get the bug fix version from Hillgrave, the software publisher that published HyperTerminal, bug fix version. I've got that on my Cisco, uh, Cisco 24 website. Uh, you can get that from that. So what syslog is going to do is, in addition to scrolling the error messages or status messages onto the screen, they can save them to a syslog server. Now, it says server, and you think an expensive data center server. This can be any cheap desktop that you just put a large hard drive into. It takes very little processing power. And he will save all the logs from all the system devices, in this case, a router and a switch, to that syslog server. And you can go into it and see all the log files and peruse back as, uh, uh, until your hard drive runs out of space. Hard drives are cheap. Just get a huge hard drive. So we can get logging information for this. So when we have system messages that pop up on the screen, or say we turn on debug. Now, debug's kind of dangerous, because if I say debug IP route, I'm going to see all the messages that normally are hidden underneath this uh, curtain as to the under the, the under the hood operations that update the routing table. And it pops up onto the screen. Uh, syslog is, should be used with caution on a Cisco device, because it can con consume expert, uh, more resources than it normally has. Uh, uh, it can consume extra resources and actually cause the router to drop packets, whereas when debug was turned off, it was perfectly fine. So we can turn on debug when we need to troubleshoot, but we should turn it off as soon as possible. Regardless, anything that sends system messages output to the local screen, it's going to be lost from that device. The device has only has a limited buffer. But we can send it to a syslog server with a huge hard drive, and we don't actually have to go to that router or switch. We can go to the syslog server and just view that text file and see it. So the internal buffer is, uh, uh, has limited space. I can only scroll back, scroll back a certain amount of time. So syslog messages can go to the logging buffer inside the router switch, limited amount of space. It can go out to the console line. It's going to scroll off the top of the screen. It can go to a terminal line like VTY1234. And, but better to send it to a syslog server. It's a real production network. We want to keep these log files where, where if someone breaks into the system or some hardware problem occurs, we can look at our logging files on all the devices and try to analyze what happened. You can control how much detailed information you want to send to the syslog file. Uh, level zero means ju just the most crucial messages. I've got to. I've got to crash now. I'm rebooting. List <clears throat> system seven is the most detailed level in that everything, warts and all, is sent to the syslog server. So if you have running out of hard drive space, you don't want to pour through a million lines of code, you can fine tune these to one of these eight levels and see how much information is sent back. Oh, let's take a break for a second and go back and look at the uh, uh, packet tracer and see. Let's see, I'm on slide number 37. Okay, hang on a second. Let's go back and stop this 
and see if our um, time protocol has synchronized. So I'm going to share the whole application, share the whole screen, share this, go up to this. Oh, look, he timed out on me. Show NTP status. Oh, I gotta guess I gotta be in the privacy there. Show NTP status. Be synchronized. Look, S1 synchronized. Let's check S2. Second mode, show NTP status. They're synchronized. It only it takes statistically three or four minutes. So they're locked into the time. So they're they're locked into that reference IP address of 10.22.0.1. And whatever the clocks were on the switches, they are now equal to the exact same time. Let's do a show NTP uh, associations. And you can see it's associated with that reference clock at the 10.22.0.1 address, which is the router's IP address. So good, it's working. It even works on Packet Tracer. It even makes you wait three or four minutes like a real router does. Uh, so this part of Packet Tracer works pretty good. Okay, good, I'll stop that. And we'll go back to sharing the files. Okay, let me see. I'm back on this slide here. Okay, we talked about the eight levels of detail that you can send to uh, to uh, Syslog, and so we can we can report on things like uh, IP addresses, uh, the uh, OSPF protocol, the operating system itself. If we're running IP security, like IPsec, we mentioned that in the earlier chapter. Uh, we can see that if uh, security is being in in effect, and we can look at an interface itself. So we can look at the interface IP address to see if the interface is up and down. And that's all reported to the lock file. So by default, the format, it looks kind of like this. So here's a sample message. Turn the pencil back on. So link percent link three up down. The interface port changed. It's a port channel. Oh, remember port channels? Oh, we've slept since then, haven't we? Oh, yeah. A port channel is port aggregation or ether channel where we take two ports or four ports and we bind them together to get 20 gig or 40 gig and it changed to the up state. This is similar to the message you see appears on the screen when you do a, a no shutdown on that port channel. So the severity level here is three. Now, if I had set my severity level to only show two or one or zero, I wouldn't see that message. If I wanna see severity level three, I need to be at level three or above so I can see all that stuff. So if I want to see everything, warts and all, I'll set it to seven where I can see all that stuff. Now, the timestamp, um, depending on the version of the iOS of the particular router or switch, that's good device you're using, um, you want to make sure that you use the command service, timestamps, log date time, which means that every line will be stamped with the current date and time down to the millisecond. Otherwise, you have no idea what time it is. Sometimes it's on by default, sometimes you have to turn it on. So we want to force them to actually display the date and time. So when we look at all those log files between the first devices, we've done NTP, we know the clocks are accurate down to the second. We can see uh, the correlation as, as something marches to the system like a, a malicious intruder or something of that nature. Okay, our next topic is router and switch file maintenance. So these, the iOS file system, IFS, it's kind of like directories on a hard disk drive. Now, on our devices, we typically only have a few file systems to worry about. So is this thing still on? So for example, the flash file system, this has the compressed iOS file. In this particular machine, they plugged in a USB device onto that USB port on the back of the router. Maybe they're going to back up something. Maybe we're going to put a new iOS on it. The NVRAM is when you copy run start, the startup configuration is stored in the NVRAM. So in this case, the asterisk tells us this is the boot system that when the device boots up, he's going to boot the iOS from that drive. This is the kind of like the default condition. So Flash is the default file system. If I just type DIR by itself, I'm going to get a list of the files. I could type di. I could type show flash colon, 
and it would show me the flash file system. But DIR is similar to the DOS DIR command that we typed to see the list of files in a folder or a directory. So this shows us all the files that are present in this particular device. So we can see all the files that are here, and this file here is the file that eventually gets uncompressed and put into RAM memory. Because when Cisco devices boot up, they take the compressed file from the flash drive. Flash drives are 10,000 times slower than RAM. And they put it into the RAM system where it executes very quickly from RAM. The earliest Cisco devices I worked with back when we started here at the uh, South Campus, where they ran from flash, they were very slow. They, there wasn't enough RAM memory except for buffer RAMs for packets. But uh, RAM memory is cheaper now, and they load it into RAM and get much better performance. To view the contents of NVRAM, I could say change directory to the NVRAM directory. He changed to NVRAM. And then he typed the list here. And the startup configuration is in here on the Cisco 4000. This is a 4000 series router, which is a newer model router. And he's got some other files present in there. And on our routers that we use in the lab, uh, uh, it's just the startup configuration to store it there on the routers. On the switch, it looks more like this on the switches. So present working directory, I always learn when I took Linux a long time ago, it's called print working directory. It tells you what directory you're in. So when you type P, PWD, it reminds you what directory you're in. You might not have a prompt that tells you what you are, what directory you're in like you are when you're in Windows. And then he lists the directory command and it shows all the files that's in there. The one we're interested in is a startup configuration file. So this router has, someone has saved the configuration. Someone has typed copy run start and it's been saved to the startup dash config. And we'll see on the switch when we do password recovery next, we'll be up to next. The switch has a kind of an alias to it. He gives it a different name, but try not to worry about that now. Now, let's look at the switch here itself. On the Cisco 2960 switch, you can also copy and view files, uh, type show file systems. I can see the ones that are present here. So typically on a switch, we have the iOS file is in the flash memory. And this switch has had a uh, copy run start has been typed because it's, it's not totally free. Some space has been used up. Now, I want to back up a configuration. Let's say I want to back up, um, I'm working on a, I'm working on in the lab, in the real lab, and I want to come back later and, and finish it up. And I, I can't just do a copy run start. You're not supposed to leave the machines with any running configuration. Besides another uh, student in the other class might erase it and put his lab on there. But you can save it to a log file. So in TerraTerm, we can go into the file menu and click log. And then it'll pop up a dialog where we can specify what's essentially a notepad text document. And then since we tell it to start uh, capturing all that information, he's going to capture all that text file to a, a DOS screen. And then when you type close, it'll stop capturing that. And then you can use a text editor, notepad, Windows, Word, whatever, and you can edit that file if you need to. Now, the problem is, when if I do say I want to type a show run, I want to save my configuration. And every about three times, you're going to have to press the space bar because you're going to get that message more. Uh, we should probably go and run the notepad program on that text file and clean up those mores and iOS messages that pop up on the screen and bother you. And here's a great trick. Let's go to the beginning of the file and type a line that says enable. Press the enter key. Configure terminal. Press the enter key. And then when you go back into the lab, the next, the next time you go there and you want to paste your previous configuration back in, you can simply paste it back in using TerraTerm. And it'll automatically take you, you can be at the user exec mode. The enable command in the text file will take you to the privilege exec mode. The config T command will take you to the privilege exec mode. And your edited cleaned up file will paste your configuration back into the router in like one second. So just go to the file menu and click send. Open up the text file, the notepad file. It'll paste it right in it'll become the running configuration on that device. TFTP, or Trivial File Transfer Protocol, is a sort of a stripped down version of file transfer protocol in that it doesn't need any usernames or passwords, and it only operates out of a single directory. It's widely used by networking devices of all sorts to uh, back up configurations and back up the operating system itself. Example, if you have a cable modem, 
and the cable and you call the cable company and you want to upgrade your speed from 100 megabit to 300 megabit you're going to pay a higher monthly rate they need to update a configuration file on your cable modem to allow the higher speed they're going to tftp that new text file to your cable modem they'll do it for you so on cisco devices we can use the tftp to save a copy instead of copying and pasting it to TerraTerm. I could do that manually for 200 routers, that would be cumbersome. But I could simply go to the privilege exec mode and type copy running config to TFTP, and it will copy the running configuration to the TFTP server that I've set up. Uh, TFT programs are widely available for free. Uh, any, the same cheap desktop you use to store your syslog files can be used as a TFTP server. You don't have to have an actual physical hardware server and an actual Microsoft server software, it'll work on any standard Windows software. So when you type running, running config TFTP, it's gonna ask you, well, what's the IP address of that TFTP server? And what's the, what do you want me to give that, that uh, name of that file name that I store from that machine? By default, it's gonna say R1 config. You can change it to a date. And then you'll press confirm. Anytime I, something in brackets like this, if you just press the enter key, it'll do that. If you type in a key, it stops. It aborts. It's a very short file. It'll only take about maybe four seconds. I put the whole thing there. And now you've got your configuration backed up. So if the device ever fails and you need to send it back to Cisco and they send you a new one because you have hardware maintenance service, the new router they send you will not have your configuration on it, but you've got it backed up and you can restore that configuration very easily. Let's look at USB ports on a Cisco router. This is the newer model 4000 series router differs slightly from the routers we actually have in the physical lab. Uh, they have console ports. They have Ethernet ports. They have uh, USB ports. Uh, the one thing I don't like about these routers is they have a wall wart power supply that you have to plug in here. And when you have a rack mount environment, now you've got that bulky, it looks kind of like a laptop power supply, and you've got to strap it back behind the rack somewhere. I like the devices that we have, the 1941 routers, because they take that standard 100 volt, volt same cable you would plug into the back of a computer to turn it on and you don't have any wall or power supply stuff hanging around so you, uh, ramp mode off usb serial a uh, universal serial bus is uh, you can plug in a flash drive into the supported slot and copy stuff back and forth from that maybe you haven't set up a tftp server yet but you got a flash drive handy and you can plug it in and you can use it at least use it and back up all your startup configs on all your devices so we can type the dr to see that on, on itself so in this case, I've typed the coming running configuration to follow. Instead of copy run start, I'm type copy run USB flash zero, and it will copy that text file to the flash drive. In this case, they already backed it up previously, and it warned them that it's gonna, it's going to. Uh, here's the default host name. The default is R1, the host name of the device dash config. It'll type the configuration, and you can change that name if you want to do something else. Then we can use the directory command to see the file on the USB drive. So we just type dir USB flash zero, and he can see the R1 config that he just backed up a second ago has been stored on that particular drive. And then you can type, this is kind of a Linux type command, more, kind of like the type command in DOS. Uh, it'll, it'll display the file on the screen. You can take a look at it. If I need to, to restore it from a, another machine, uh, say this machine fails, this router fails, and I get a new one from Cisco, I could then copy the backup file from the USB to the running config of the new router, and it'll be back in operation very quickly. So let's see, what are our rules for, for system administrators and network engineers about backups? What are the three most important duties? One, have a working backup. Two, have a working backup. Three, have a working backup. If you don't have something backed up, you're gonna to have to recreate it from scratch. Oh, what's gonna to happen to our company when our RAID array fails and we've lost the accounts receivable file? Oh dear, and I have no backups of it. So all our accountants gonna call all our customers and say, we don't remember, we lost our file. We don't know how much you owe us. Uh, can you send us in however much you think you owe us this month? Because companies that lose their backups and have no good backups, or they never made backups, 90% uh, of them will be out of business before the year is over. 
So that's your most important file on your company's uh, it's just the accounts receivable. This is how much money we're owed. Okay, password recovery. I'm going to illustrate password recovery uh, in the week when we come back from Thanksgiving on that uh, Thursday. I will illustrate the password recovery for both the router and the switch. And this relies upon a little secret technique here in that we're going to go into the ramen mode on the device and that differs on the router and the switch there's two different methods step two that's for the router we're going to change the configuration register and then we're going to copy the startup configuration and the running configuration and change the password we don't care what the old password was we're just going to change it to the new password uh when do you need to do password recovery well let's say the previous network engineer left ever wrote down the password. No one has any idea what the passwords are. Maybe he left under, maybe he was mad when he left and he purposefully changed the passwords to something that no one would ever guess and then he left. Maybe he got hit by a bus and no one has any idea what the password is. So we need the ability to be able to change the enable secret password without completely erasing the whole device and starting all over again. There's probably no documentation of the current configuration of this either. So after you change the password to something you know, and in the real world, do not use enable secret class. 10 million other Cisco Network Academy students already know what your password is. Use another password that's more difficult to guess. Then once you update the password, you're going to do another copy when you start to resave it and reload the device. And the gotcha that I mentioned here is any NFS reports that were up and up, you have to do it. Eh, I have no shutdown on them to bring them up. Oh, that sounds kind of convoluted and weird, doesn't it? Okay, on a router, you can get into the ramen mode by when the router first boots up, about a 60 second window, you can, can enter the break character. On TerraTerm, there's a, there's a menu option that says send the break. On HyperTerminal, it will hold down the control key and hit the break key. But on uh, TerraTerm, you have to go to the menu thing, send, send break. And when that's the boot up procedure is interrupted and you get this ramen prompt, ramen monitor prompt. In Windows, there's a similar feature. When you first turn on a Windows workstation, there's a brief interval of time in which you can hold down, oh, it may be the F5 key, it may be the F8 key, it may be the control key, depending on your version of Windows. And you can interrupt the normal boot up process of a Windows workstation. They go into the safe mode where you can do some repair. Maybe you uh, installed a, a new VGA device driver for your new super duper graphics utility card for your gaming program and the device driver is corrupted. And now when you boot it up, you get the fuzzy screen. You get lines across your screen. Well, you can boot to the safe mode and you can repair that and put in the proper device driver and fix it. So in the Cisco routers, we do this in the first 60 seconds. We're going to introduce the break character. And then we'll be able to go through this repair process. Now, there's a thing called the configuration register. If you do top the show version command, you'll see that the normal configuration register is 2102. The zero X at the beginning indicates this is a, this is a hexadecimal value. We're going to change one of those bits. And hexadecimal four characters is 16 binary bits. The configuration register contains 16 little binary bits. And depending on what they're set, you can do password recovery. You can change the baud rate of the account support. You can change how the router boots up and things of that nature. The uh, uh, only thing CCNA people are interested in is the password recovery feature. So we're going to change the config register from 2142, uh, 2102 to 21, uh, uh, 2102, the normal, to 2142. Now, I can't do this on the router because I don't know the password. I can't go to the privilege exec mode and go to the configuration mode and change the config register at the iOS prompt. So when you control break to... Uh, send break character and get to the ramen mode. You can do this. You never booted the iOS yet. This is in the this is the limited strip down iOS that's in the ROM chip for disaster recovery purposes. Two types of disasters are no one knows the password. It's the first disaster. The second disaster is someone holds the iOS file. I need to copy a new one there. So we're going to use the ramen prompt to do this. So once I get to that prompt, I'm going to type change the configuration register and then type the reset command and that will reboot the router. And what I've told the router to do is uh, kind of like what I did with Windows, and it said go into the to the uh, uh, you know suspend mode, not suspend mode, the uh, the 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 uh, limited mode. <clears throat> what I've told the router to do is when you boot up, 
pay no attention to the startup configuration file, which contains the password that I don't know yet, and act as if you were a router that has no configuration. So when you boot up the router, he's going to put that question mark on the screen that says, well, you want to go in the global configuration mode? And you're going to say no, and you're going to fix it. So what I'm going to do is, next of all, I'm going to do something that's very dangerous here, because your muscle memory wants to type copy run start. If you type copy run start right now, you will have just wiped out your only copy of the running configuration backed up in the startup configuration of the device. What I want to do is copy the startup. Notice I'm already at the privilege exec mode. There was no password. There's default routers have no password. Now I can type copy the startup configuration, which contains the password I want to change into the running configuration. I'm already at the privilege exec mode. I don't have to type in the password because I'm already there. And now I can change the password to what it should be. So I'll go to the configuration mode and type enable secret Cisco, whatever the new password is. Don't use Cisco, don't use class. In the real world, you use a hard password. I only use this as an example here. So now I've got the configuration in the RAM and with the new patched password, and I can change top, top new updated running configuration that has the password I know, back to the startup configuration. All I've changed is the password value. Oh, yeah, we better change the configuration back to 2102, because otherwise, when it boots up again, it won't boot up anymore in case the power is lost. So that's password recovery in the router in a, in, a, in a nutshell here. I will illustrate this to you a week, two weeks from Thursday. This week, this week Thursday, Thursday, we're doing that 10.2 lab uh, on NTP and Cisco Discovery Protocol and Link Layer Discovery Protocol. And then next week, we're off for Thanksgiving. But the week after that, in the lab portion, I will do that as a lab instructor lab demo. And you will all get credit there by simply being enrolled in the class. Now let's look at iOS management. And we're almost done here. So TFTP servers can be used as a backup location. I can also back up. I can, we saw the code earlier for backing up the running configuration or the startup configuration. We can also use the TFTP server to back up the iOS file itself. Now, it takes more than one second to do that. The iOS files are 100 million lines of code. So that way, if we have different versions of the iOS running across our company, we can store a backup operation from them. And in case some unforeseen incident destroys or corrupts the iOS file, it doesn't load up, we've got a backup copy. Otherwise, we've got to log into Cisco and download it from them, and you have to pay them for maintenance to do this. So production networks usually contain multiple different versions of routers. So we want to keep a Cisco, we want to keep this copy of the iOS software image in case that router gets messed up, if that switch gets messed up. So we'll just use our existing NTFP server. We're already using for the configuration files, the startup configuration, running configuration files. And that way we can have a backup copy of all the configurations and all the operating system files. So that way we can restore any machine quickly, put the proper iOS on it, and then put the proper configuration up to make it work. OK, here is the best practice for backing up the whole iOS image. Step one, we're going to ping the IP address of that TFTP server to make sure we have connectivity. Ping is a good check to make sure we have real IP connectivity with another device on the network. Uh, step two, go to the TFTP server and see if he has enough free space on that to hold that file. That file could be 100 meg or something. How big is it? We can do the DIR command or show flash zero command on the router we're backing up and see how big that Cisco iOS image file is located. Then we're going to copy the TFTP server using the copy command, copy flash TFTP, for example. And, t and then it'll query us what's the IP address of the TFTP server, uh, what's the file name of the iOS, what do you want the file name to be on the destination server that's saving it, you usually want it to be the same. And then the transfer will begin. It may take a minute or two because it's a fairly big file. So we ping the TFTP server and make sure it's connected. We verify the amount of free flash on the device. And then we say copy TFTP flash. And he asks us, well, what's the IP address of that TFTP server? And he's given it this TFTP server as an IP version 6 address. And then what's the source file name on this router we're copying from? Here's the source file name of our 4000 series router. Destination file name, 
by default, the exact same spelling. If you want to change the bracket spelling, you can make a new spelling if you want. And then it will access the TFTP server. It'll copy the file. In this case, we get several exclamation points as it copies the entirety of that file. In this case, it was, um, how big is this file? One, five, it's half a gigabyte, 517 megabytes. And it copied it, oh, look at there, it took, took several minutes to copy it because it was so big. But now it's successfully backed up. We have a backup copy. We're not buying maintenance from Cisco because we only pay for it. We can't download it from them if we don't have maintenance. Um, that's a false economy. You should absolutely buy Cisco Smart Mint hardware and software maintenance on all your Cisco devices because if there's any problem at all, you can look to them for a free overnight shipping of a failed hardware module. If you have any software problems, configuration problems, their Cisco engineers will help you with this. If you have not purchased any SmartNet service for your devices, you can still get free software updates from Cisco if a published security vulnerability has been issued on any one of their products. They will give you the free iOS software update on that router or switch if there's a security vulnerability that's causing a problem. You just have to know to ask for it. It's kind of like the secret hardware warranties with the car dealers if there's a problem with the, with the emission system. They'll fix them for free forever, even if it's not in the warranty. As a secret, there's also a secret a lifetime hardware warranty on all Cisco Catalyst switches. So if there's ever a hardware problem with the Catalyst switch, they'll replace it for free. You'll probably get a new one because the old ones, they don't sell them anymore. Any of you um, uh, A-plus guys ever done the dual boot situation where you're going to install a Linux on your Windows machine, you're going to set it up for dual boot, you're going to carve out an extra partition on your existing hard disk drive and put the Linux in that partition and the existing windows will be in the other half of your partition. And after you install Linux, every time you boot up the computer, it'll put a screen up and says, do you want to boot up Linux or do you want to boot up Windows? And you can choose which one you want to boot up. You can do the same thing with Cisco routers and switches. You can have a existing iOS that's a, maybe an older legacy version, and maybe you want to try a new one to make sure it works in your company production environment. So long as you've got enough free space on your flash drive, you can have an extra uh, second copy of a newer iOS with maybe new features on it. And then you can go type this command boot system. You're going to go to the global configuration mode and you're going to say boot system and you're going to put in the file name of your new iOS you're trying to try out to see if there's a bug fix. And then you'll do a copy run start, save it, and then the next time you boot up that system, instead of, because by default he's going to, the uh, when the system boots up and does the power on self test, He's going to try to load the very first iOS file he finds in the file system, in the IFS, in the iOS file system. Well, that's your old file. You don't want that. So you can put this boot system command, and then when the, when the Cisco devices boot up, they load the, before they load the iOS, they take a quick sneak peek at the startup configuration file to see if there is an existence of any boot system command so they know which one to boot from the file system. If it's not present, they go ahead and boot the first one. So this way you can determine, you can specify which one you want to boot up. And if it doesn't fix the problem, you can always change it back to boot system, the old one, and go back to the old one. Uh, this is called rollback roll back and commit. Let me do any operation. Uh, either, uh, either the transaction must succeed as a whole, we're going to commit to it. Or if any part of it fails, we need to roll back to whatever it was as if nothing happened in the first place. This is like financial transactions. This is a financial systems uh, term. When I transfer $10 from my savings account to my checking account, what if I took $10 out of my savings account and then the line went down? Am I $10 poor? No. The system, the transaction will be rolled back. If the $10 is successfully taken out of savings and put into checking, now my checking account has $10 more and my savings account has $10 less. The transaction succeeded as a whole, we commit the transaction. If any problem occurs, we roll back as if it never happened. So we need to do this in IT as well. So when I came in on the weekend 25 years ago to upgrade to the new version of Novell Netware, and it didn't work, and nobody could log in, it was on a Sunday, I was testing it. I had to roll back to the old version because the new version had a bug in it, it wouldn't work. <clears throat> so this is the lab we'll be doing on uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, you guys are coming in person, we'll do this on the real equipment here. Uh, the gotcha in the lab is the lab says G001 on the Cisco 4000 series. Our routers are G01 instead of G001. If you're going to do this lab on Packet Tracer, just specify a Cisco 4000 series router 
and the two switches and the lab instructions will work just perfectly for you and everything in this lab will work just fine on packet tracer well guys i think that's another one for the books i'm going to hang loose here for a second to see if there's any chat inquiries and uh, then we're going to log off and you guys that uh, uh don't want to come in for the lab i'll see you guys a week two weeks from today for our next class lecture class online class and uh, this session is being recorded let me stop the recording